This is the Court Leader's Advantage, a podcast series for court professionals and by court professionals. Brought to you by thecourtleader.net and in cooperation with NACOM, the National Association for Court Management. What do we know about how the public views our courts? We know that the public's trust and confidence in courts has been slipping over the years. The 2021 National Center for State Courts State of the Courts survey found that public trust in the courts, along with other institutions, has been declining for some time. In that survey, 64% of respondents said they either had a great deal of confidence or some confidence in their state courts. But that is down from a high of 76% in 2018. That same survey asked, How much do you agree with the phrase that the state courts provide equal justice to all? For the first time, state courts were slightly underwater. 46% said the phrase described the state courts well or very well, while 47% disagreed. In addition, this year, public confidence in the United States Supreme Court, symbolically the paragon of our court system, sank to 25% down 31 points from its 1988 high. That year, 56% had confidence in the Supreme Court. I'm Pete Kiefer, and welcome to the Court Leaders Advantage podcast series. This month, we're going to explore how and why the public views the courts the way they do. Now, we're going to depart slightly from our usual panel discussion format. We've asked five individuals, both judges and court administrators, a single line of inquiry. How do their friends and neighbors view the courts and why? We think this very short on the street type interview will be very revealing. As I mentioned, we're asking them about people they know, people who do not work in the courts. What do they think about the courts and why do they view the courts the way they do? What we're looking to find out, has trust and confidence in the courts truly been decreasing? Or in fact, do people still rely on the courts and their fundamental fairness and impartiality. And if trust and confidence is in fact fading, what are the reasons for the change? Is it a personal experience? Does it come from the media? Or is it some other factor? My co-host today is Stacy Worby, State Jury Coordinator for the Alaska Court System. The folks we'll be asking are the Honorable Yvette Alexander, Judge with the City Court in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Honorable Ed Spillane, Judge with the Municipal Court in College Station, Texas. Rick Pierce, Judicial Programs Administrator for the Administrative Office of the Pennsylvania Courts. Kent Pankey, Senior Planner with the Supreme Court of Virginia. And Sarah Brown Clark, Elected Clerk of Court for the Municipal Court in Youngstown, Ohio. Thank you all for joining today's podcast. And Stacy will start off by asking the question. Judge Alexander, you have heard the survey statistics. When you talk to folks, how do they view the courts and why do they see the courts the way that they do? Do they still have trust and confidence or have they become more dubious? Thank you. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Yvette Mansfield Alexander and I'm the Chief Judge in Baton Rouge City Court. I am also the president of the American Judges Association. A shameless plug, if you're a judge and you're listening or you're on this podcast, I invite you to join the American Judges Association and find out everything that we offer. When I talk to my neighbors in my community, I get different reviews. First of all, it depends on what level of court you are discussing. Second of all, most Americans or most people in my neighborhoods, they don't even know the differentiation between a municipal court, a district court, a court of appeals, and then the Supreme Court. They just know that you're a judge. And if you're a judge, then you should know the answer to any question or should be able to help them with anything that they want you to help them with. I think as a whole, with everything that's gone on with the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court has sent out a message to our community that maybe that trust is um, going down. A lot of people in my community didn't quite understand how 
the Supreme Court of the United States of America could whirl through some appointments and others just take a long time. They also have not been very happy with some of the decisions that have been coming out. As a judge, we're not allowed to really talk about those decisions, but we are allowed to listen and try to impart our wisdom. What I say to people in my community is this system of justice that we have is the system of justice that we have. So if you're going to try to change it, you need to become a part of it, or you can just sit over there and complain. I think that if I took a survey of the people in my community, I would find that as far as the court system in the town I live in, the idea is that it's a great court system. They believe that they can get fairness. They believe that justice will prevail. But when you talk about on a national level, then you may get a different opinion from them. I also believe that the people in my community, each person is concerned about the court that they have to touch. So if they get a traffic ticket, then yes, they believe that our traffic ticket, that our traffic court is gonna give them the justice that they deserve. If, they, if something happens to one of their family members, they want justice for that family member. So I think that the, my opinion would be that the confidence in the justice system is not as good as it could be, but it's also not as bad as it could be. And it depends on where you sit as to how you look at where the system is. All in all, I know the, the, the report says that the confidence is dwindling or going down, which may be true, but I think that it's our job to promote that the system is the system that we have. And in order to become uh, more comfortable with it, you need to get involved with it. I also believe that the confidence of the American people for the justice system as a whole has dwindled immensely with um, Roe v. Wade, with the last appointments on the US Supreme Court. Um, but I also believe that that court is gonna be there a long time. So we're gonna have to work within that court to seek the justice. I also believe that our job working for the court, either as a judge or an administrator, is to encourage people to come and visit our courts, to find out about our courts, to know who runs our courts, to know the quality of individuals that work there. And then maybe they will understand better that we are trying to build confidence in the courts. In our court, we do surveys to see um, what people think when they leave our court. And of course, because I am on a municipal court, my surveys are usually good. You know, the judge took time to listen to me. The people who worked there were very friendly. I had a few questions, they answer, answered them. Um, I believe that in municipal and lower courts, the confidence is high because they actually come in contact with the court. They actually go down there. They actually meet the, see the judges and they actually know the personnel. When you're just watching on TV and see the things that you hear about a court, then your confidence might not be as great. There have always been two things that American people, the American public complains about where courts are concerned. It costs too much and it takes too long. So is that still going on? I would suggest it probably is. So our main focus should be on making our court, court costs go down, which is almost impossible because of the things that are included in them, and to make sure that it doesn't take a long time for an individual to get to the point where they perceive they have received justice. Rick Pierce, you have heard the survey statistics. When you talk to folks, how do they view the courts? And why do they see the courts the way that they do? Well, thank you for, uh, for the invitation to speak, uh, Stacy and Peter. Uh, I think the media has really largely shaped the public's perception of the courts, uh, at least for, the, for those people who I interact with and converse. And that's mostly the national media. The national media appears to report on all of those events or kind of decisions with such sensationalism that it's rarely seen as objective. And I think the people, the, my friends and colleagues realize that that is not objective reporting. 
Uh, as a journalism major and a former news reporter, it really saddens and frustrates me greatly that uh, our news media has taken this uh, perspective. Now, I will say that differs, though, with the local media. The local media representatives are much less inclined to employ, you know, the, the sensational reporting tactics of cases with local interest. And then although I have no data to support my claim, I think that the citizens have a slightly higher level of confidence in our local courts in general limited jurisdiction than they may have of the appellate state courts or the U.S. Supreme Court, in large part because uh, the national media is not reporting on local cases. They're reporting on only of cases of significant interest across the country or at least of significant interest across the state. Uh, I think that that confidence does take a nosedive, however, when you have a highly publicized scandal or even when a jurist or administrator has a known reputation for mistreating individuals in his or her courtroom and doesn't provide uh, procedural fairness. I think uh, the courts are also uh, uh, at times lumped in with law enforcement. And I think this started, probably started much sooner, but more recently with the case um, in in Minnesota in 2020, where you had law enforcement, uh, now eventually that officer was convicted of murder, but charged and the courts were lumped together at, for a time. You know, I, I do harken back though uh, on what the courts could do. And first thing that always comes to my mind is procedural fairness. Uh, our first court administrator in the, in the federal court system, Ernie Friesen, has always said that the first purpose in courts is to do individual justice in individual cases. And the second purpose is to appear to do individual justice in individual cases. And I think when our courts falter to do those first two purposes of courts, the public's trust plummets. When we adhere to those first two uh, purposes of courts, I think the public's trust and confidence grows. Thank you, Rick, for that insight. Kent Pinky, when you talk to folks, how do they view the courts and why do they see the courts the way that they do? There's probably some slippage in overall confidence. Most of the people that outside of my work cohort, um, we're talking about people in my neighborhood and people in my church community. Um, in both groups, attitudes are <clears throat> affected by both personal experiences and by media coverage, as uh, Rick has already mentioned. I think for my neighbors, coming from a neighborhood that's you know, not really prone to crime, most of their personal experience is gonna be uh, traffic tickets, personal injury, domestic cases, and jury service, whether it be in the federal or the state courts. And most of their experiences to the extent they have complaints about the courts are gonna to relate to what we can sum up as being managerial issues, customer service, delay in hearings, um, using cattle call dockets instead of segmented dockets and failing to uh, implement modern technologies for communications and transactions. Not a whole lot there has really changed uh, from past years with possible exception of expectations where technology is concerned. My church group is a little more diverse. It's very socially active uh, across the Richmond metro area. Uh, social justice initiatives there touch on all kinds of issues, housing and gun violence and education on other issues, which have all worsened because of the pandemic. And <clears throat> I think in increased awareness of those problems and the connections to the justice system, particularly in evictions and uh, greater problems of long-term access to justice, um, have brought home to a lot of them in ways that they weren't previously aware of, just how important the court system is to resolving some of these issues that we've long been dealing with uh, as, as part of a larger uh, religious community. So from both of those aspects, there's a slight diminishing of, of public trust and confidence in the courts. Not great, but at least from their personal experiences in local government, I'd say that there's some, some drop. Uh, I think more significantly <clears throat> for both groups, 
Uh, there's the political polarization that they're aware of <clears throat> and hear about in the, in the media. And that um, that taints general feelings of public institutions and the courts are tainted, obviously, by association with other government entities. Um, although Virginia doesn't have partisan judicial elections, uh, which obviously can be rather embarrassing for the court system. Um, my friends are fairly well read and they, they know that just because judicial selection in Virginia isn't out in public, it, it tends to be just as political as anywhere else. And that doesn't really, uh, what they read doesn't improve their perceptions of the court system. Um, I think most damaging though, uh, has already been mentioned is the Supreme Court's recent um, activities. And although my, my liberal friends would obviously be unhappy simply because of the decisions themselves, I think even my conservative uh, friends would admit to being somewhat concerned about how the court is operating. And they may lack the vocabulary to exactly explain what bothers them, but I think e even the court itself in the last week or so has been commenting upon public doubts about its legitimacy. And I think what my friends are picking up on um, is touched upon by Douglas Keith uh, the last week or so from the Brennan Center for um, Justice. And he said that the court has basically brought this concern about its legitimacy on, on, on its own, you know, its own making. And yeah, throughout our nation's history, we've had questions about, you know, people being happy or unhappy with the court's decisions. But what's really been going on now <clears throat> exhibits what I would say is a lack of judicial restraint uh, in terms of how it operates, and that affects the public's perception of of whether it's neutral uh, and nonpartisan. And for example, here I'm, I'm talking about whether the court uh, decides issues that it has to or doesn't have to, and it has elected to, but it's noticing basically where it didn't have to. That's not something that is traditionally done. For, uh, a lot of decisions are being made now on the shadow docket with orders that don't have any explanation that the public can see. So they're left to think, well, it must be a partisan reason. Um, there are a number of ethical lapses that um, Clarence Thomas's with his, with his wife's involvement and in some of the um, things that were decided about public communications with the president's office is only one of many. Every, every one of the nine justices has had an issue of ethical lapses that the court has has not accused itself um, have, have it has no ethical standards unlike just about any other court in the country, even though it could impose something on itself, it chooses not to. And lastly, it's been relying, <clears throat> particularly among the originalists, on a number of decisions that are academically dubious. Um, and would seem to be cherry picking historical interpretations to support their decisions. All of that as a sum makes the public wonder as to whether the court is talking about what the law is or what the <clears throat> justices believe they want the law to be. And if the highest court in the country can't be trusted to be fair and neutral, then it taints all the other courts by implication. Sarah Brown Clark. If you want to talk about my court specifically, I can say that people have become much more confident in the court than they were 20 years ago. Because 20 years ago, we had all white male judges and a white female clerk staff. And um, People felt like, and, and I'm a community, the demographics of the limited jurisdiction municipal court has a lot of diversity in it. So they really felt like it was a David and Goliath situation. And I think that people 
are more comfortable now. They do. They at least they say that. Maybe they say that to me because because I'm so likable. Okay, but but um, generally speaking, uh, recently highly publicized court cases have split the opinion right down the middle. Um, you you have the cases where um, people who have police officers who have gone too far have been um, found innocent by the courts. And then you have the cases where police officers who have gone too far have been convicted by the courts. And it's split right down the middle. And so I, I think that people are still uncertain about the equal application of justice in the courts. And 50-50 isn't bad, but we would like to see something better. 50-50 uh, isn't bad, it could be worse, but we would like to see something better. The technology and the media um, have either made the courts look successful, impartial, and of course, you know, you can turn on your computer and be in a courtroom real time. And that really can confuse a person who's not familiar with the process and the rules. So finally, let me turn the tables on Stacy. Uh, how do they view the courts and why? I think most of the people I encounter, maybe online or uh, through other means, tend to lump all courts together as one. So I think I find myself educating people quite a bit on the separation between the two. And uh, I think that's very helpful for people to understand. And it's kind of a shame that they don't necessarily understand that off, um, right off. But um, any anyone who doesn't have confidence in the local state courts or the local uh, district courts, maybe they do not have a complete understanding of the process. So I think it's part of my goal personally to educate people. Um, when we see people, jurors coming through our courthouse, we try and educate them as, as much as we can on the process here and how it might be separate from national processes. And I think that knowledge will go a long way to uh, help people understand and separate the different levels of court. I think from my seat, I have an opportunity to improve the perception of the court. When my staff interacts with people who come from the courtroom, now I need to tell you that my staff takes a lot of abuse because they are not going to cuss at Judge Alexander or Judge Spillane but they are going to come to the counter after the fines and costs and they've been found guilty and they are irate and they are coming down. They don't think anything has been done properly and they will give my um, staff the what for. My position with my staff is this. You treat, first of all, you are not the judge. It's not your fault. And you are not evaluating this case. You treat these people the way you would treat your mother and your grandmother, even when they call you out of your name. And um, so we, we collect the money. We, we put the holds on the licenses and the registration and all of that. But when they come to our counter, my policy is you treat these people with the respect that you would want someone to give to your mother. So I have saints and angels in my office. And we have an opportunity to ease some of the hostility that the guilty feel once the court process has been complete. Judge Spillane, when you talk to folks, how do they view the courts and why do they see the courts the way that they do? Uh, it's, it's too... 
it depends really on what you're talking about. Uh, when we're talking about the Supreme Court and the media, I do sense that people feel that the courts are not as fair, that they are. I think the effect of uh, even the president politicizing the court has had an effect on people in thinking that it's who you know or what party you're at and just in general life isn't fair. But I think when people, when I talk to my neighbors about local courts, I do get different answers. And, and it also depends as others have said about what type of court. Um, I, the one thing I know that, that my neighbors and we're in a college town just like Baton Rouge, um, college kids especially, but just in general, the public want, are demanding that they can interact with our court through technology, uh, that they, I, I, perhaps one good effect, if there is a good effect of the pandemic, is it sort of, at least it forced me to increase the access to my court through the use of virtual hearings, through the use of online. Uh, I, I wouldn't have had a YouTube court channel if it weren't for the pandemic. Now we use that to educate our mostly uh, pro se defendants on how they can clear their record through an expunction or seal their record. So uh, I, I get a much more favorable sense of my neighbors when we're talking about our local courts. But I do find it interesting too, listening to the comments um, that there is quite a difference between the court. When you look at surveys, most citizens, their idea of court is municipal courts or a version of that, a justice court or a city court. And when you talk to lawyers and other, those who practice the most in court, their version of court is more of a district type of uh, state court. So what we call court is very different um, uh, depending whether we're talking and the media mostly will center on district courts uh, and they'll also center much more on the Supreme Court. And I do see a, you know, a sense that uh, court is not as fair as it should be uh, with the politicization of the Supreme Court and some of their decisions, quite frankly, uh, lately. But as the local court, I have a much you know, happier sense of their confidence but I do think we're challenged to make sure we increase that access to uh, our, our neighbors, the citizens that interact with our court. Uh, we're not their advocate, we're not their attorney, but a lot of times it's our job to educate and let them know what their options are. Listening to Sarah Clark talk about her clerks, you know, I so much rely on our frontline staff, which is the clerks. Our clerks interact with our citizens 90% of the time compared to me. And uh, they do an incredible job because they have, you know, the liberty interests of these citizens very much. You know, they are a part of that uh, in terms of our citizens understanding the process and the consequences. And they do a great job. And, it, and But for them, the image of my court is very much based on their interactions as well. I want to thank Judge Yvette Alexander, Judge Ed Spillane, Rick Pierce, Kent Pankey, and Sarah Brown Clark for joining us today and sharing the insights they have gathered from the public's perception of the courts. Their observations have certainly added to our understanding of how the public feels about our court system. I also want to thank my co-host, Stacey Worby, for her insightful questions that I am sure will spark even more conversations. As always, my thanks to you court professionals tuning in to today's episode. You are the public face of the courts. It is your skill and competence that provides the public with the positive perception that it has of our court system. Thank you. Join us on Tuesday, November 15th for another episode dealing with the issues facing our courts. This has been the Court Leaders Advantage podcast series. I'm Pete Kiefer, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for joining us today. The Court Leaders Advantage is a regular podcast on courts and court administration. Today's episode will be available on our website, on YouTube, on Facebook, on iTunes, on LinkedIn, and on Twitter. Become part of the conversation. If you have questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes, email us. 
Our address is CLA Podcast, that's all one word, at nakemnet.org. Did you hear an interesting comment by one of the panelists that you would like to listen to again, but you don't want to search through the entire episode to find it? The additional resources section of the webpage contains a question time marker sheet. Just find the discussion question on the sheet, and next to it is the time that question was asked. You can then quickly fast forward to that time in the episode and listen to the panelists' comments. Remember, if you don't have time to watch an episode, you can always listen to the audio version. Listen in your car or on the bus on your way to or from work. You never have to miss an episode. I'm Pete Kiefer, and on behalf of our guests, the Court Leader website, and the National Association for Court Management, thank you, and have a great day. The views, information, and opinions expressed during this episode are solely those of the host and the individual presenters. They do not necessarily represent the position of the National Association for Court Management.